everyone. Welcome to the Physics and Astronomy Colloquium. Uh, I am very pleased to be able to introduce uh, uh, one of our own as a speaker, Dr. Barbara Anthony Poirot, one of our esteemed astronomers. Uh, she got her start uh, as an undergraduate at Notre Dame University, then went on to Yale University, which uh, I, which I think she met Bruce, right? Yep. Right? As, as the saying goes, the, the rest is history. Um, uh, we spent a couple years at the University of Texas, uh, and then ended up here, where she has spent um, a bunch of time <laughs> doing um, astronomical research, observations, not here, but elsewhere, and uh, lots of teaching of astronomy. And we are curious to see what you say about metallicity or lithium in the stars. Well, I can talk about metallicity, too. And I want to point out that it's a tough act to follow, Bob Curry. Um, in part, uh, you mentioned that we've been here a while. It's, it's a while, and he is the one person that has been here longer than Bruce and I have. So with his departure, we'll be truly the older, oldest farts in the department, I guess. So that's for the video. <laughs> Starting off right. I actually do want to start off right. I want to talk about um, all the people that help make this possible up front rather than at the end when it gets marginalized a little bit. The work that I'm going to talk about, especially today, is a little bit of a departure. Bruce and I um, developed a collaboration with Condelianus, who's pictured here at Indiana University several years ago, really developed that, um, matured that, the semester that we were on sabbatical in 2008. A sabbatical made possible by our colleagues, then uh, Greg Rudnick and Steve Hawley in their first semester here, and Steve Schall in his final semester at KU. But it's a departure because mostly we've used imaging and, and measurements of the light output from stars in different wavelength regions before and had not done very much spectroscopy. So a lot of our sabbatical was spent learning how to do this type of observation and analysis. So the principles in our collaboration, and we've been funded since 2012, are myself and Khan and Bruce. We have added um, Donald Lee Brown has been working with us since his arrival in 2013. Uh, we've added collaborators as we go, and I've called these collaborators in law because they are contacts that we have primarily through Khan's network of theorists and observers. And Bozgard is a very esteemed astronomer at the University of Hawaii with access to those big telescopes they have on Mauna Kea. So in principle, that's going to be great for us to have her as an add-on to our team. NSF, thank you. We have to do this. We have to be able to report that we did that. Thank you. One of the nice things about having Khan Delianus as a collaborator is his status at Indiana University. And Indiana remains one of the partner institutions in a telescope consortium. This is the larger of two telescopes that they manage at Kitt Peak National Observatory. This is my only instrumentation slide, I think. But it's nice to have a little bit. That's a 3.6 meter telescope. It looks funny because it's an Alta Az telescope, so it doesn't have the usual sort of point at the North Pole mount or orientation. This is a little bit of a, an image of the Hydra spectrograph. There's one in the southern hemisphere now too, but there's apparently some dark energy experiment that has kind of taken over the telescope that that used to be on. So we are largely restricted to observations in the northern hemisphere these days. Hydra positions those fibers. It has up to 100 fibers that it has little actuator rods and it can take about a half an hour to reconfigure so you don't do that often or lightly. Um, we, because of proximity constraints and the fact that the fibers can't cross each other, we're usually happy if we can position 60 or 70 fibers at a time. But it makes observing very efficient and it's also high resolution observing. So we have um, resolution in the wavelength region we're going to care about of less than 0.2 angstroms per pixel. So that's 
a little bit of instrumentation. Other thank yous and people that I want to introduce to you, in particular Ryan Maderick, who these are Khan students. Before we had a graduate student of our own here, we were able to interact with Khan's graduate students. And as I said, I learned a lot from them. Ryan has just joined Benedictine as the faculty member, replacing Scott Baird, who is retiring. So we'll probably be seeing Ryan in the near future. We've also worked with Stephen Houston and Boku to undergrads here at KU. Evan Rich is now at Oklahoma doing <laughs> very similar things at Oklahoma. Sam is at Indiana University, although not working under Khan's direction. Dave Thomas and Dave Shudell, all these other folks worked on this project over the last several years in various capacities. So that's my preamble and thank yous, acknowledgments. I'd like to kind of break this into two pieces. Um, the first is a little introduction to this element because it seems like it should be a very straightforward element. It's number three. Should be able to knock through that pretty quickly. More interesting than that, I'm happy to say. And the second part will be more focused on the observations that we have designed, the experiments that we design to get at increasingly subtle features of stellar evolution as evidenced by lithium. So lithium for us is a probe, but in order to understand its value as a probe, we have to understand its place in the scheme of things, literally, the cosmic scheme of things. So this graph shows, these, this and several other are introductory text photographs or images, but this one shows the relative abundances, the cosmic abundances of the elements. And it's pretty clear that things go down. This is a log-log graph, so by the time you get to oxygen, we're down three orders of magnitude from hydrogen and helium. Lithium, beryllium, and boron are all way, way down. We don't get to competitive abundances until we get to carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And the reason for that is that they are products of nucleosynthetic reactions and alpha buildup. So they become pretty common in the lifetime of the cosmos because they're produced by stars. These guys, not so much. So that's one point for us to consider. And that number is many orders of magnitude down from hydrogen. How do we know that? How do we build that graph? Most of that graph is built by geochemical observations of materials from the solar system. Same way we know the age of the solar system, it's actually a geochemical result. But geochemical analyses of meteorites, some of which find their way to Earth, make possible these relative abundance measurements. So this is a geochemical publication, the one which is now the classic. I think I saw that it has 20,000 citations when I checked the citation today. It's in a journal I, I couldn't tell you. It's a, no, kind of an obscure journal. This is one carbonaceous chondrite meteorite. There have been others that have been studied. But the punchline of this slide is we know the abundance of lithium in the solar system as it was forming because that's what's preserved in the meteorites, the most primitive meteorites that we can study. This is a definition of how I'll be describing the logarithmic abundance of lithium and it is reference to the abundance of hydrogen. Another point you may know or may suspect that there's more than one isotope of lithium, there, there is, but um, in the solar system the more common isotope outnumbers lithium-6 by a lot, by 12 to 1 or so. So that's a point we might want to look into. This is also from that Anderson Graves uh, article, and it shows, I'm sure you can't see, but as we go to higher and higher atomic number elements, the relationship of the abundances in the sun, as we can observe it, and in the meteorites, is fine for most elements, but really discrepant for lithium and beryllium. So two orders of magnitude difference between what the solar system formed out of and what we now observe in the sun's atmosphere. So something's happened and part of our goal is to figure out what that sort of something process might be. Whoops, I went the wrong way. So 
How do we do that? How do we actually measure the abundance of an element in a star's photosphere? I'll say a little bit about that. Uh, we may have a question at this point, why? Why is the sun's lithium abundance so suppressed compared to what solar system formed from? And we'll get to some answers. I don't know that we have a complete answer yet. So here is the obligatory HR diagram of an astronomical colloquium. And I won't dwell on this very much. You've either seen some of this or you haven't. Um, but all of what we first learned about stellar astronomy can be described in this diagram. This axis covers a range of about an order of magnitude in surface temperature. Colors are telling you what it seems like they're telling you. The hotter objects are on the left and look bluer. What I maybe should focus on is the sequence, the main sequence, where 90% of stars are found. There's a mass range here of maybe three orders of magnitude from 60 down to less than a tenth of the sun's mass. A huge luminosity range. And they, these faint diagonals are lines of constant radius. So we have fairly similar structure stars here. So this is apparently a single valued sequence of increasing mass and increasing evolutionary potential. The surface temperature axis is the one that is easiest to get at because you can kind of look at a star and measure its color. You can do more than just say that it's red or orange. You can actually quantify its color pretty closely. And that's well correlated with its surface temperature. What we further anticipate is that for stars especially that are similar to the sun in structure, main sequence stars, they're burning hydrogen in their cores pretty stable for a long time. What we expect is that thermodynamic equilibrium obtains in the atmosphere of the star. So the temperature that describes the radiation field is essentially the same temperature that describes the excitation levels of atoms and ions in the atmosphere and the balance of ions and neutrals. So those are all wrapped up into pretty basic statistical equilibrium expectations. And it means that stellar spectra that have these seemingly random placements of absorption lines aren't random at all. This is ordered approximately in temperature order. And we expect the relative strengths and appearances of, the, of those features to tell us the physical temperature of the gas in the atmosphere of the star. So it's all part of our expectation of what the physical conditions in a star's atmosphere are. What spectroscopists measure, and I'll show you a spectrum and some lines that are kind of key in a second, uh, and I'll be talking about equivalent widths. It's really just an area measurement. Our, our expectation is that to first order, that area is describing the optical depth or the opacity of the line. So how many attenuation lengths has the light from the, from the photosphere of the star had to beat its way through in the atmosphere, what's reflected in the absorption line. So optical depth, equivalent width, they're telling us the column density of absorbers that are in the correct excitation state, correct ionization state, all of which we think we understand how those numbers relate to the overall abundance of the element. So that's all correctable. So that if we figure out how many absorbers are in a column that are producing absorption lines, we should be able to reverse that calculation and figure out how many lithium atoms there are altogether, not just the ones that are in the correct excitation level and ionization state. This, in fact, is a spectrum of the lithium line region. And I've drawn a rectangle that shows what we mean by an equivalent width measurement. It's an area, but we cite it in one-dimensional terms. We talk about the width of a rectangle that has the full extent of the spectrum in its area. So for reference, I think I have on the next slide what this equivalent width is approximately. It's kind of a tenth of an angstrom maybe for these stars. These are lithium lines. This is the lithium transition and this is basically the one line that we can measure. 
And these are very similar stars because all the rest of these lines look pretty similar. This is a calcium line, the rest of them are iron. And these are several stars of obviously increasing lithium line strength. Whether that means lithium line abundance is something that we have to qualify just a little bit. The sun's lithium line is really, really weak. We can just about barely measure it with the equipment we use. Um, the lines that you saw there are quite a bit stronger and a lot of what we work with is in between. So that's a little bit of what we technically do. Obviously we don't sit with paper and draw triangles as people once did to measure those areas. Uh, we use digitized spectra and fit Gaussians to them and record the width of the line. So, a little bit of summary here for the stellar astronomy part. To first order, most spectral lines get weaker. Most lines get weaker as we look at hotter and hotter stars. Any star's equivalent width must be corrected for the temperature of the star for us to actually describe the abundance. If we do everything right, then the abundance that we derive shouldn't be dependent upon the temperature of the star. We do expect cooler stars to show stronger lithium lines, which might make looking at cooler stars easier. I have a question. Uh-huh. So the lithium inside a star is not fully ionized. I mean, it's stripped of all electrons because you said it's bound to bound. We're only looking in the atmosphere. Okay. So what we see is very shallow and the lithium that is in most stars' atmosphere is neutral. Okay. So this is a neutral line. 1.5, why lithium is important. Why a lot of people think lithium is important. I think it's kind of important. Um, lithium is produced in the Big Bang, so we have very explicit predictions about how much lithium should have been produced in the first few minutes of the universe's history. As a function of this basic parameter, the baryon to photon ratio. And each of these graphs is describing helium, helium-3, deuterium to hydrogen ratio, and lithium-7 production relative to hydrogen. And the box <coughs> is describing this range of eta that is suggested by these measurements. This yellow band is the range of eta that is suggested by interpretations of fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background radiation. So this is called concordance because it looks pretty good. So generally speaking, there's concordance between the predictions of Big Bang nucleosynthesis models, really parameterized pretty simply by the baryon to photon ratio, and what we predict from other sources. So just forward moving the density evolution and the temperature evolution of the plasma that forms these elements in the first few minutes. These are reasonably recent results for lithium abundances and they're in numbers so I've translated it to the terminology that I'm using lithium logarithmic abundances. Remember that I said the solar system abundance is 3.3 What's in the sun is one point something. What is predicted to have been formed in the first few minutes of the universe's history has a logarithmic abundance of 2.6. So, solar system has more than that. So lithium must be getting made somehow. So over the last 13, 14 billion years, some lithium has been produced. A lot has been destroyed as well. But there must be some production channel. Mm -hmm. What's the uncertainty on those two, two measurements? Uh, a couple tenths, I guess, probably in the log. May no, not, maybe not that much. I didn't translate this numerical abundance into an uncertainty. I'm sorry, I should have, but probably not that big. Questions are good. Feel free. All right. So it looks like we have a discrepancy on the one hand that Big Bang nucleosynthesis produces a lot of lithium, but apparently not as much as we're all floating around. Solar system formed four and a half billion years ago, and it, there was more available then than was formed initially in the cosmos' history. One of the production channels 
that has been known about for a long time, and I'll only mention it because it helps answer some questions and poses a few others. Pretty sure that lithium can be produced by cosmic rays banging on the most abundant nuclei out there in the interstellar medium, which are, other than hydrogen and helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So, a long time ago, by Hubert Reeves and other people, Jean Audouze, um, if you fold together reasonably straightforward models of cosmic ray flux, interaction cross sections, and what they took to be a fixed abundance of these elements in the interstellar medium, what do you get? You predict reasonable amounts of these light elements, beryllium, lithium, and boron, but the isotope ratios don't seem to match what we observe in the meteorites of the solar system. If you think about it, you're just banging things together. There's no big reason to prefer lithium-7 over lithium-6 by an order of magnitude. So those predictions don't match what we see. So the supposition is that cosmic rays produce some lithium, but not all. And in particular, there must be a formation channel for lithium-7 other than cosmic ray spallation on CNO nuclei. So, we might be looking for that. And I will not say a lot about this, although we've um, worked a little bit on evidence for production of lithium in odd little places. This is the way it would have to work. This is helium producing beryllium which decays pretty quickly, something like 60 days, 50 days, into lithium. In fact, these are basically side chains for nuclear reactions which on, on bulk take protons and turn them into alpha particles. So you'll see that alpha particles are at the, the back end of these reactions. So these are alternate chains to the predominant proton-proton simplified chain of reactions that is operating inside the sun's core. Point is, you can make lithium from beryllium, but the conditions that will admit that will very quickly destroy the lithium. So if you have temperature conditions that allow for the production of beryllium and its subsequent de decay to lithium, you're going to lose that lithium just about as fast as you make it, unless you can move the beryllium quickly and far away from those high temperatures. That seems really contrived. Um, I'm not sure that it was particularly obvious to Cameron and Fowler, but this mechanism is being invoked because we don't know of another way to explain the production of lithium in some situations. One of them is Novi, and we've recently observed the production of this isotope of beryllium in Novi, and that's perfect because you produce the beryllium and the whole thing's exploding outwards. So you do satisfy one of the requirements. You've produced beryllium, it will decay to lithium. Haven't directly observed the lithium product, but it's presumed to be produced in Novi. So that's one of the channels that could produce lithium as well. So I won't say too much more about lithium production. So I've given you the layout. Why lithium is important to people, um, has a lot of astrophysical touchbacks. How can we design experiments? And I, I thought the hardest about how I wanted to talk about this because we're constrained to be passive observers as astronomers. So the only control we have is in choosing the targets that we observe and understanding why we've chosen them. So talking about the star clusters that we've chosen to work on is a fair amount of what I want to impart to you. So we have a standard profile of what we expect of the structure of a star and how it will progress, how it will evolve. Standard stellar evolutionary theory is almost the vanilla version of what you might calculate for a big gas ball with all the processes that you can put into it. Standard stellar evolutionary theory is not quite version 1, maybe 1.5, um, but it includes no more complication than the star's mass 
the star's chemical composition. There are a lot of really important things that we know exist in stars that are not accounted for in standard stellar evolutionary theory. They can be added on, but those important things include the fact that stars are spinning, <laughs> so they do have an axial um, symmetry axis. We don't know exactly what the internal profile of rotation is. Stars do form in pairs and are affected by interactions with binary partners. Stars do have magnetic fields. Stars do have diffusion processes and other processes that might lead to homogenizing some layers and not others. That's the, that's the vanilla version of theory and that's the context in which we try to design experiments and comparisons with observations. This is the set of observations that we'll try to gather in appropriate context clusters. So, the context that we choose is a controlled context. So you can go out and study stars all over the sky, but you'll know relatively little about them if you do that. If you study stars in a cluster that you have reason to think formed all at the same time, you've learned a lot. First thing, you know that they're all at the same distance, so you can establish that distance very precisely. They should all have the same composition, chemical composition, and they should all have the same age, modulo the ones that might take a little while to form. So we look at star clusters because they're coeval and they simplify a lot of things. So we've removed as many variables as we can. And if you think back to that HR diagram, which I think I have another analog of in a second. Higher mass, higher luminosity, faster evolution. That's the key to basic stellar evolution theory. So this little animation, there used to be a better one, but it's, it's succumbed to Java rot. and I can't get it to run anymore. But what you saw there, let me back it again, is a couple of time steps for the evolution of stars. Given enough time, these guys burn up very quickly, they're gone. After several billion years, all the stars that were pretty massive have evolved and become giants. And we may see them as giants, but basically the stars that are left in a cluster after several billion years are all quite small in mass. So that's the basic context of looking at clusters and considering them as objects with relative ages that we can know quite a bit about. So this is a superposition of HR diagrams, Hertzsprung-Russell diagrams for a number of open clusters, oh, still running up there, of different ages, where this is the oldest one shown. This is about the age of the sun, and these are variously less than a billion years and less than 100 million years in age. So in doing that, and looking at clusters of different ages, we're going to be catching stars of different masses in this pretty vulnerable stage of evolution where they're just leaving the main sequence and going through some pretty abrupt, at least in astronomical terms, transitions in their structures. All right. So if we're going to compare observations to theory, these are the benchmarks that we need to consider. Temperatures at which lithium will be destroyed by nuclear reactions, anything above two and a half million degrees. So the core temperature of stars is higher than that. So somewhere between the surface and the core, lithium's going to start to get wiped out and will be wiped out all the way from there down to the center. How deep is the layer at which that temperature kicks in? For the sun, it's a little beyond 30% of the way in from the surface. The real question is, okay, I can tell you maybe, based on standard theory of stellar structure and evolution, at what depth that temperature is reached. Question is, is there any connection? Is there any circulation between that layer and the surface? Because it's the surface that we're able to observe. So accounting for surface abundances of lithium needs to account for transport, not just of energy, but of material. So another standard textbook figure is, this is the sun in all its glory. 
in two zones, basically. So again, this is sort of our basic vanilla model. The inner zone for the sun is radiative. So energy is being passed out by radiative diffusion. Um, the material itself is not moving in bulk. But in the outer layers of the sun, the material is moving in bulk in convective cycles, just like in atmospheric science. So convection moves energy very efficiently. It tends to kick in when temperatures are low. Um, it kicks in basically because radiative transport just can't move the energy out fast enough. And it mixes the layers in which it is applicable. So this is a little diff of the surface of the sun. This is the small scale granulation of the sun, but you can look at the sun and see this bubbling, which is evidence of convection. Cooler the star, the more extensive this is going to be, the deeper this convective dome is going to go, and the hotter the temperatures are going to be at the base. So if we've got a big extensive convection zone with a pretty high temperature at the base, we're going to see destruction of lithium at the base of the convective zone and it's eventually going to get mixed to the surface. Protostars, as a side, are basically all convected <laughs> and they manage to destroy all of their lithium if they're cool enough. In fact, finding a lot of lithium in a very small star is basically a, an operational definition of a brown dwarf, something that will never be a main sequence star. But again, the vanilla version of stellar structure. Got a couple kinds of stars. And I'll be talking about this range first of all. The cooler the star, the deeper, the more extensive its surface convection zone is. And you see if you go cool enough, basically they're convective nearly all the way to the core. Not so much for the sun and stars near it in mass and surface temperature. Higher mass stars are complete, completely flipped. The outer part of the star is not mixing, it's not convective. Energy is passing through radiative transfer and the convection is actually occurring in the core. So we have a, a pretty big distinction between those two classes of stars here. Can you explain why? Why? Um, the main thing is the temperature structure. Convection is very susceptible to any region that has a very high temperature gradient. More massive stars have much more temperature sensitive fusion reaction rates, so they're going to be convective. And then the higher temperatures of the outer layers, radiative transfer seems to be fine for getting energy out. So, so you mean the mass density or is actually temperature distribution and the chemical abundance of stuff that um, impedes the transfer of radiation. All right. Well, the surface convective zones that pertain to these lower mass stars, um, thicker, I've, I think I've already said that the the lower the mass of the star, the cooler the surface of the star, the thicker its surface convective zone is, the hotter the temperature is at the base. And we thought, oh, maybe that's our explanation. Maybe this is why the sun has chewed up two orders of magnitude of lithium in its four and a half billion year lifetime. Is the temperature at the base of the sun's surface convective zone less hot? No, <laughs> it's not. So that's not a, an adequate answer, at least not in the context of our standard model, standard set of stellar evolutionary and structure models. So the temperature is not predicted to be high enough to disturb the abundance of lithium at the base of the surface convective zone. So we don't have an answer quite yet for the sun's strange lithium abundance, at least suppressed with respect to what it formed from. In the last 20 years, people have started to add on features to standard stellar evolutionary theory, obviously, but it, it's very difficult. Rotation is one of the first most obvious extra features that should be added. And in fact, these, are, these models are 20 years old or so by um, Mark Pinsano, our um, collaborator-to-be or collaborator-in-law. 
he constructed models that are basically standard models, not too much extra bells and whistles going on in these models. And for cooler stars, we do see that it's predicted in these models that lithium is suppressed over time. So the youngest isochrone is at the top here, 100 million years, 700 million years, 4.5 billion years. And the depletion is going to be more extreme for the cooler stars. It's also more extreme the higher the chemical abundance, the metal abundance of the stars is. Okay, we have an expectation for cool stars. So we sh know what we should look for in clusters of different ages. We should see something like that pattern of declining lithium abundance as we look at older and older clusters. What about the warmer, more massive stars? Well, <laughs> as far as we predict, there really isn't a predominant zone of convection at the surface of these stars. They're warm. They don't seem to have chromospheres for the most part. They don't seem to have the features that go along with this turbulent mixing layer like we see in the outer part of the sun. So we don't expect to see depletion of lithium in these warmer stars. So do we? I think I'll skip ahead to the sun here. So hold that thought. Do we see depletion of lithium in warmer stars? If I look back at the sun now, Let's start to pay attention uh, to the sun and try to frame it in the context of these predictions of standard stellar evolutionary theory. Maybe not even in the context of theory, maybe in the context of stars that should be similar to the sun. Is the sun's lithium depletion extreme? Is it unusual? Whether or not we can explain it. These are stars that are as nearly as we can figure the same mass as the sun, but at different ages. And what you see plotted is the abundances of lithium for these stars as a function of stellar age. And there are big error bars on the age. That's the hardest thing to do because these are stars that are observed to be just isolated. They're not in cluster context at all. There's the sun. And these are models that incorporate a little extra mixing into them. Um, what we learn from these is not particularly informative as far as discriminating between these models, but we learn that the sun's depletion of lithium is not out of the ordinary. We just haven't explained it very well. The one other thing that we can learn about this is that if we look at beryllium, which is destroyed at temperatures just a little hotter than lithium, it doesn't seem to evolve with time at all. So whatever extra process we need to look for in terms of mixing above and beyond the surface convection zone doesn't go very much deeper than the temperature necessary to destroy lithium because beryllium seems to not change in stars over a wide range of age. So we haven't yet really explained the sun's depletion but we've learned that it's not unusual. All right. The context of clusters. This is the context in which we say we're going to work because we can look at a bunch of stars who we know a lot about them. What distinguishes one star from another is the mass it starts with and the time that it takes to evolve. These are stars that are uh, clusters that are reasonably young plotted with predictions by Mark Pinsano for the development of lithium abundances with time and as a function of surface temperature. So the sun's temperature is about here. These are stars that are cooler. Pleiades, 70 million years down to something which is a few hundred million years. So for the youngish clusters, eh, you could say that those match the predictions reasonably well. So when we start looking at clusters that are approaching a billion years, not even that, down here, that we start to see some discrepancies. All of these clusters are shown with the graph characteristic of this one cluster at the bottom, traced through them, the Hyades cluster. It's about 700 million years old. And here's what we see. 
These are stars that are so warm that we don't think they have a surface convective zone. We have no expectation that they should have any way to deplete lithium at their surface. Not only do they deplete it, but they knock it out so much that we can't observe it. Almost everything you'll see for stars in this temperature range is upper limits only. So bizarrely, at this one temperature range, there is a mechanism that destroys lithium. It only kicks in after a few hundred million years. It has a very discrete temperature range, a couple hundred degrees either side of that. Temperature, not mass, temperature. And astronomers, having learned what kinds of things go on at particular temperatures, know that certain instabilities occur in very discrete temperature ranges because the depth of something unstable is going to be a function of the overall surface temperature of the star. So that's just a point of information and perhaps suspicion. Masses of the stars in that gap are 1.3 solar masses, give or take. And what we've learned over the work we've done in the last five years is once established, that pattern doesn't change in looking at clusters that are less than a billion years old, a billion years old, a couple billion years old. Yeah? So it's in a large destruction, uh, if you've already said it, but when there are destroyed, what are they transformed to? Boron? Lithium? Helium. Oh, yeah, helium. it'll just get buried in all the helium, so it's going to be effectively invisible then. This is the one cluster I want to talk about in particular to wind up and show what we've shaken loose from not just this cluster but a few others that we've worked on. And a lot of this really kind of coming to grips with in the last month or two. So Donald and Stephen helped us a lot over the last summer um, to get through some of these spectra. And I'm going to be talking about spectra that have given us horrible, horrible nightmares. But that's not the case for this cluster. It's been a beautiful cluster to work with. And we are in the process of writing our third paper on this cluster. Um, it doesn't look that photogenic <laughs> in this cluster. In this picture, it's not a very colorful star cluster. But it does have the virtue of being in the Kepler field. So it's had a lot of um, publicity and extra analysis because of that. Here is our beautiful diagram. So I'll, I'll beg your indulgence why I gloat over this baby picture for a minute. Uh, all those gray points are stars that we've observed in the field of this cluster. Some of them might not be members of the cluster. It's kind of hard to tell without additional information whether it's background, foreground, doesn't belong. But we do have ways to get that extra information. All of the colored points are stars that we actually put fibers on in that spectrograph. We have over 330 stars in several different configurations that we have high dispersion spectra for and lithium abundances for. The red ones are stars that we eventually decided were pairs, binary systems. So when you see the spectrum lines going like this, you know you're looking at an orbiting pair of stars. Um, we decided that some of them aren't members. And there's a star there that if I have time to, I'll tell you about its little story. But um, the main sequence used to be there. What's left is here. And the turnoff mass, the mass of these stars is 1.4, 1.5 solar masses. So we have a lot of lithium abundance. We've never had this much data before. This is the first cluster that we've worked on that went beyond the dozens to the hundreds. Boy, you learn a lot more <laughs> with a lot more data. Um, I guess that's a lesson we all know. And I'll, I'll walk you through some of these graphs, but these are sort of not even hot off the press. These are not even in press. These are just being written. This is color or temperature and brightness. And since we hope we're looking at all cluster members, you can gauge that as luminosity or energy output, at least in relative terms. These are the stars that are leaving the main sequence. These are the stars that are now giants. And they may have even been up the giant brands more than just this first trip by the time we're observing them. On the side here for one-to-one -one correspondence and brightness level, we have the lithium abundances. So 
that we have fairly high lithium abundances and these black dot means we actually got that line measured and assign an error bar to it. The triangles mean we only have an upper limit. So there may be very much less lithium than the point indicates. As you kind of expect, because the stars are getting cooler as they expand away from the main sequence, they're evolving into much larger structures and becoming cooler. Convection becomes a much more important part of the structure of the star, and lithium becomes diluted and depleted as the stars evolve. So we sort of expect, as we look at more and more evolved stars, that lithium will go down, and it does. These are lower numbers, lower abundances, with a couple exceptions including that one magenta point, which seems to have figured out a way to make lithium on its way to this status. <coughs> I don't have a whole lot more to say about that. This graph shows the less evolved stars. So these are still on the main sequence. These are kind of peeling away in their gradual evolution. And in my standard picture of what stars do, I would sort of expect that each one of these points a little bit higher up, but it's just a little bit more massive and is now a little bit further along in its evolution. And that's probably still largely true, but there might be a, a wrinkle to that that we're uncovering. What you see is this drop off in lithium below this point. So all of these stars are in this dip. And these are mostly upper limits. So there's this sharp decline, really sharp. This temperature range is like 50 or 70 degrees Kelvin. It's incredibly abrupt transition from stars that are depleted and stars that are not. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious about the left figure. Yes. So basically your horizontal is a temperature. Yes. So if you look that way, it means at a given temperature, then you could have a two different uh, kind of uh, orange several different kinds of stars with different luminosity. Yes. Um, so why is that? So it means that it's not just temperature and uh, determining the luminosity. So you're saying that we have stars at the same temperature but really different luminosities. These stars used to be over here. So as they started out, they were much hotter. Every star, when it evolves towards death basically becomes cooler along the way. So this is where these guys are now. They haven't spent that much time in this cooler state, won't spend a whole lot of time in this cooler so temperature they region. Cool down, but they, still have higher luminosity. they do. Okay. And they stars don't lose luminosity as they die, which is paradoxical. They just the cores just get hotter, they just keep cranking out more energy, but they get very distended. Is there another question? Uh, I should get to a punchline. Let me, let me get to a punchline. This is the punchline. How about that? All of what we've done the last few years is to study a number of clusters. Oh, this is part of the punchline. I think I've got a little more punchline. So it's punchline part one. The dip, this feature of F stars, we have learned by looking at clusters of different ages, it doesn't show up until clusters are established a few hundred million years into their lives. Once established, it doesn't seem to change very much. Um, we've learned what the mass of the stars in the dip is as a function of metal abundance. But again, the temperature is really very constant from one cluster to another. This is getting to the punchline because we look for other factors that might also coincide with this temperature range or mass range of stars. And this is the other characteristic of stars that we've started to notice. And it is in fact this characteristic that has given Donald and me fits with at least one of the clusters we've worked with. One of the other features of stars just in that range where the dip occurs is that that is also basically the temperature and mass range for, mass, for main sequence stars where they dramatically stop spinning, or at least going from more massive stars. They may have very large rotational velocities of more than 100 kilometers a second. And then for the cooler stars, it's much more sedate. Sun rotates at 2 kilometers a second. 
So it's a very, very noticeable transition in overall characteristics. Hotter main sequence stars can have a big range in projected rotational velocity. So if we're looking at the width of a line, we can only infer the projected rotational velocity from that. People who study cooler main sequence stars don't try to measure the rotational velocity. It's very small. They try to measure the period of the star's rotation. So if it has spots or something like that, you just kind of wait for the spots to come around again and see how long that takes. But the general pattern is that more massive stars, yeah, they don't live as long and they are hotter, can have very high rotational velocities, but cooler main sequence stars, not so much. Much more modest um, rotational velocity profile. In fact, uh, people, this is by, uh, they actually made it into science or nature this past year. This is by Brandt and Huang from Princeton. I didn't get the highest resolution picture I, I might have maybe, but this is for cooler stars showing this is temperature getting cooler this way. This is age getting older this way. And this is rotational period. So as we look at older stars, their rotational periods are longer. As we look at cooler stars, their rotational periods are longer. If we have a whole cluster of stars, it should describe a, a curve on that surface. In fact, these guys think this is so predictable that they think they can get ages for stars in the field of the galaxy this way. And you'll notice that this is the cluster I'm talking about. So here's the punchline. This is what we have pieced together looking at this cluster and the other cluster that is so problematic. Having lines that are broadened by rotation of 100 kilometers a second, 150 kilometers a second makes them a nightmare. Everything gets flattened and washed out. Lines overlap more than they did. It's been very, very difficult. But some of these are gross constraints. What this graph is showing is some characteristics of stars that are just a little above the dip and a little below the dip. In this older cluster, about 2.3 billion years, in the somewhat younger cluster up here, and the one in between, which we studied six or eight years ago, where we only had a few dozen stars. So it's kind of hard to see that this supplies a missing link, but hopefully it does. These are roughly the same stars taken or seen at two or three different snapshots. So by the time these stars are 2.3 billion years old, two things are apparent. One of them is apparent here. There aren't any fast rotators in this cluster. There's still a lot in this cluster. So something pretty dramatic happens over that span of time and we may be able to see the intervening deceleration of, of spin for these stars in the intervening age. This other graph connects the two, the, the samples that we see here and it particularly applies to the stars that are above the dip. So they presumably have every reason to maintain the lithium that God gave them when they started. Do they? The youngest cluster has the greatest proportion of stars that still have lithium abundances near the cluster maximum value, what we think the cluster started with. The older cluster where, whoops. Is that why you pick clusters? Yeah. Age. Age, how far away they are, how faint we can go. Um, chemical composition, if they're in the northern hemisphere and we can see them without offending decency on a southern hemisphere telescope, you know. So, but age primarily, age and chemical composition. By the time these stars have evolved another billion years or so, we expect that they're going to be like this, where fewer of the stars have preserved their lithium. 
So the connection seems kind of clear. It's a smoking gun, but we don't exactly know what caliber it is or exactly how this mechanism works. That there is a pretty obvious connection, not between the spin of the stars, but how they spin down and how abruptly they spin down. You can kind of imagine that a deceleration mechanism for a star, and we know very little about how that couples to the interior of the star, will involve some pretty dramatic structural rearrangements for the star's structure and its subsequent evolution. So this is the punchline final conclusion slide. We have really just formulated these suspicions in the last few months, but the last few years have convinced us that the lithium did feature on the main sequence. Star is about 7,000, 6,600 Kelvin. Not 7,000, a little cooler than that. That feature is a fairly fixed feature after a certain amount of time has gone by, a few hundred million years, and then subsequently it doesn't change very much. Um, this is stars for which we have no obvious connection to processes that could mix things below the surface level that we're observing. But there must be something. There must be some process that is involving mixing to lower depths and higher temperatures. So the extra mixing that must be going on, we believe, is connected to the loss of angular momentum and the consequent restructuring of the star's interior by whatever mechanism is going on. I stress that this is only one thing that might be going on. Stars are also evolving. As they evolve, they get larger. <coughs> they spin down just because they get larger. And they're also getting cooler. So there's a lot of things going on in these stars, and it's going to take a little more time for us to disentangle the competing effects. But it's been really fun finding more questions than you started out with. So I hope the NSF feels the same way. Thank you all. <laughs>